I'm going to talk about the rise of the compilers. Um, they have this new Terminator movie coming out. It's got like Genesis with a Y. It's got the dragon lady from Game of Thrones as, as, as Sarah Connor. Um, but I'm thinking back to the, uh, the rise of the machines, um, T3, and we're seeing the rise of the compilers with JavaScript. It's exciting. It's what I've been predicting for too long, like a mad prophet, and it's coming true. Um, let me first show you something. How many people saw this? It went by just the other week. This is awesome work by Sean LeBron. Um, written in ClojureScript, compiles to JavaScript. JS is the sun, and uh, we're all in orbit around it. ES3 was 1999. I've talked many times about how I had to rush in May 1995, as Peter mentioned, to get a demo done inside Netscape to convince everyone who doubted that there was a value in having a scripting language that you could embed in HTML. That very early JavaScript was rapidly standardized as ECMAScript. Sounds like a skin disease. Um, not a wanted trade name. Went through the first edition in 1997. And then the second edition was, I think, just the ISO version of that, the International Standards Organization. The third edition was in 1999. This was the big one that had nested functions and regular expressions and uh, switch statements, things like that, things we take for granted, but that weren't necessarily there uh, earlier. Some of those features were coming in uh, 96, 97. So ES3 was big, and that was when Netscape was going down, so there wasn't anything after that for a while. ES4, which was frankly my attempt to get Microsoft to pay attention to standards again, along with doing Firefox to restart browser competition, just a few pieces of work that had to be done. ES4 was this attempt to work with Macromedia, then Adobe, on ActionScript 3 from the Flash Player and the fourth edition design that was done by Walter Moore Horwat at Netscape in the very early noughties. Um, and it failed. We mothballed it. It didn't fail in a, in a way that was useless. It failed like good science. Negative results are important. We learned from it. Pieces of ES4 are in ES6. But as a sort of a recovery um, rehab session, we did ES5 and got, got everybody back together. And that was part of the Harmony era that I inaugurated in Oslo in 2008 when I group hugged and, and made rain and helped everybody um, see the light in laying ES4 to rest, but also working uh, incrementally on improving the language. ES5 was that fairly conservative um, change to give us things like strict mode. How many people here use strict mode? Raise your hand. OK, that's good. And uh, you know, Kangaxis compatibility table documents. It, it is very widely implemented now, um, mostly green. Um, there's a shim that is not really needed now that IE9 and 10 and 11 and everything has ES5 support. Um, ES6 just finalized. I'll get back to my talk on that. But this is the big one. This has ideas from ES4, like generators. How many people are using generators or, or using things that use generators? Um, there's a compiler called Regenerator. Um, and of course, there are the, the big compilers. Um, Bevel and Tracer, ES7, which you know, now we're supposed to call this ES2016, and ES6 is ES2015. It's too long for Twitter. Um, how many people here are going to say ES2016? Nobody, good, okay. Um, and then ES8, well, maybe that's ES2017. What we're trying to do now is get on a, a standards release cycle that's much faster than the historic cadence which was interrupted by you know, the IE monopoly and uh, ES4. We want to have a rapid enough release cadence that we can implement as we standardize so we don't end up writing specs that have no implementations. We want to do smaller specs. So every year, we should have a new spec, and it should already be implemented in the canary or nightly builds of the top browsers. And that's happening. And because that's happening and because there is still a background of old browsers, as there always will be on the web, People are starting to use transpilers, compilers, um, Babel, Tracer, others. The great thing is, with Node.js rising, people are also willing to use you know, build steps, grunt automation, whatever, gulp, to make things happen 
with their code, whereas 10 years ago, I used to run into developers who would say, I never want to run any kind of preprocessor or compiler. I just want to code JS to the metal, so don't get in my way. Now people are used to it, which allows you to hook in a compiler as well as a linter module system, things that prefigure the standard module system and other features coming in ES6 and 7 and beyond. So it's really great that the developer community has embraced compilation because it's inevitable. It's the way you solve the version problem on the web that is always there as long as you have different browsers rolling out at different times and different installed bases lingering on old browsers. It's great that Firefox, Chrome, and others have automatic updates every six weeks. Uh, it took some user uh, onboarding to get people used to that. Not all browsers do that. Not all parts of the world can do that. Not everyone can do that. And beyond the compilers or the, the sort of version mocking compilers, we have the rise of um, static typing, something we tried to do in a hybrid way in ES4. It's kind of researchy, but with tools, you can do um, what you might think of as more of a warning system. It's, it's tool time only. It, it doesn't mean that your code is safe at runtime from exceptions that the type system would have checked if it were truly a static type system, but it's, it's still very useful. It finds bugs. So TypeScript has been very successful for Microsoft. And Flow, sort of building on TypeScript syntax, changing the type system a little, making it more um, aware of the idioms you use in JavaScript, making it um, do more inference and be more convenient. Uh, Facebook Flow is very exciting, too. And uh, of course, the Angular folks have now gotten board the TypeScript bandwagon, and maybe Flow and TypeScript will co-evolve and converge. We don't know. There's also the August Closure Compiler from Google. How many people use Closure Compiler out there? Some hands. Anybody using Flow and TypeScript? Yeah, TypeScript's doing OK. Um, finally, there's an experiment <laughs> just started in V8 uh, with the ECMA TC39 committee, the JavaScript standards body, on board to try to do something like ES4, but maybe less ambitious, to try to do an optional opt-in sort of use stricter mode, and uh, companion to that, a, a type system, an optional type system, uh, sort, of, sort of gradual typing. Um, we'll see how that goes. It's early yet, and the V8 guys really need to lean into it this year in order to get something that we can then user test and evaluate in the, in the committee and among other implementers of the language. Um, so stuff is really happening fast now. It's, it's, things have been going crazy for a while. I, I did a talk with Jeremy Ashkenaz in 2011 at JSConf US about CoffeeScript and about adding languages. Jeremy was saying, go invent your own languages, and it's happened. So there's CoffeeScript, there's Dart, which I told them so. It wouldn't be in a, a VM in a, in a browser because it's, it's very expensive to add a second virtual machine second language engine to any browser, even Chrome. And it's, it's almost infeasible to get it in all the browsers. So it's, Dart is doing very well. I, I've noticed the dev compiler is doing great. They're, they're a compiled JS language. Now they need JS to be the right target language for Dart. And ClojureScript, which this presentation is written in, is uh, David Nolan's version of Clojure. It's awesome. And there's like hundreds of these. This is, this is just one sample that makes a decent sized slower system. But if you think about the, the true you know, the verse from Firefly with, you know, dozens of planets. That, it's more like that in hundreds of planets and moons, all habitable magically. Um, so that's, that's where JavaScript is. This is just the, the solar system of JavaScript um, from Sean LeBron. And I just wanted to show uh, a couple more things. Here's the Babel page. Those of you, anybody using Babel out there? It's babeljs.io, and it does a lot of stuff. One of the signs that JavaScript is not done evolving is that in order to compile to older versions, you have to sometimes fake it a little bit, and the abstractions leak, or it isn't the perfect emulation, or the performance it might not be great. When we actually have all the affordances in the standard language that allow anybody to compile any language to it, then I think we'll know we're done, because we won't have these, these leaks or these little flaws in, in representing the, the, um, the new language on the old. Um, and this is for my demos, which I will get back to. Thank goodness I found my slides again. All right. So that's Solar System of JS. Here's the lovely picture I took in Paris, um, but that's not where we were. Here's where we were uh, on the Inria roof uh, meeting room. And here's a slide Scott Hanselman showed last year's Fluent, a very funny talk. 
He's, he's from the, uh, the forest moon of Portland, the outpost uh, of the, the new Death Star of Microsoft. And um, you see it on YouTube. And one of his slides, this slide, shows you what an operating system provides in sort of a schematic way. Memory management, graphics, storage, security, threading, events, networking, APIs. Well, what can't JS do? It can do all those things, but there are some gotchas. Can't do 64-bit integers. Can only do 53 bits in floating point. Um, but I, I made a proposal in Paris that got approved to the next stage for ES7 that allows us to do 64-bit in a way that all the engines can quickly embrace. It's a, some funky methods that the super hacker Fabrice Poulard proposed we add to the math object, but it allows compilers to compile true 64-bit operations and, and engines to optimize them. JavaScript can't do safe stack allocation. Um, you can do unsafe stack allocation in C, C++, and more is the pity, and there's still security problems with that. Um, but uh, Rust makes stack allocation safe. For instance, the Rust language from Mozilla. JavaScript doesn't have stack allocation. Everything's garbage collected. Sometimes you get a garbage collection pause. Stack's useful. Maybe you can do it with typed arrays. We'll talk to you in a minute. But it's, it's going to be uh, slow. We also would like, with these new typed arrays and objects, to mix things together more. That's coming, I hope. And finally, the big one, threads, which I'm going to talk about a bit. And I blogged um, a while ago saying threads suck. And they do. And I said they wouldn't be in JavaScript except over my dead body. Uh, <laughs> I'm still alive, so uh, maybe I'm selling out, but I haven't got the cash yet. Because the real reason to add threads is to support cross-compiling C++ to JavaScript and Scripten. All the games, the stuff I'll be demoing, all the things that people build, even on, on mobile, where C++ is having its like fourth life, fourth re revival. Um, People are writing C++ code a lot. And a lot of that code uses OpenGL, uses other standard APIs, can be mapped efficiently to JavaScript. And it is. So some of that code uses threads. And what are you going to do? Scott's diagram had workers, web workers, HTML5 web workers as the solution for threads. But they're shared nothing. You can do things with typed arrays. Here's a schematic view of a typed array. Remember, you can have multiple views of the same memory. You look at it as bytes or 16-bit integers, or 32-bit integers. Good stuff. It's in all the top browsers now. Um, it's been up there for a while. But you can only copy things to a worker or hand off one of these typed arrays. Um, there's Ash. I've got to do that. You, you can't share memory with workers. And you really don't want to share the DOM. It would make it horribly slow. It would add a lot of bugs to browsers to make it somehow symmetric shared memory mapped. So, there's, there's a mismatch here. C++, which has been around for a long time using pthreads, threads, OS level threads, and JavaScript with only shared nothing workers. What are we going to do? We're doing something. And this is collaboratively with, with Google and others. I think all the browsers are more or less on board, Apple and Microsoft. Um, there's an idea of shared worker. I'm not sure if this actually is sticking. I think this is a vestigial at this point, and they're just making the regular worker have access to this memory. But if you had a shared worker and you wanted to confine memory to it, you could use this thing, and then regular workers couldn't see this kind of memory. And most of you who programmed workers, all three of you, um, know how this works. It's not the easiest API in the world. There's some things to fix there. HTML5 APIs are also a work in progress, just like JavaScript. But you can post message. OK, what's new? Shared array buffer. It's just like array buffer from typed arrays, but it has the shared prefix on the name and all the view types, uint8 array, uint32 array, float32 array, et cetera, have the shared prefix. And you have to use them to say that you're willing to use shared memory. And you cannot use the unshared kind interchangeably. Once you make one of these things, though, you can pass it to a worker via post messages in that last line there with the blue. And instead of transferring it, handing it off, or copying it, um, it will actually be shared. And that's how this, this works. So you can set up a bunch of workers that all share access to a very big piece of memory in one of these new shared array buffers. There are atomic operations coming, because you need the C++ code to implement its, its locking, its mutexes or futexes, fast user level uh, locking. It, it needs, needs something. So there's a, a set of atomic operations. I'm not going to linger. And this is not only in Firefox Nightlies, but now there's an intent to implement, and somebody's actually hacked it up for Chrome. So this looks like it's going to happen. This is what Unreal Engine 4, which I demoed last year, really wants to use all your cores. Um, let me go to my demos. 
for just a couple of games. Um, the big uh, announcement was Unity 5 supports JavaScript and WebGL, as in JS, as it were. Um, this is Prime World Defenders. It's a fun game. I'm not really good at this, though. We'll see what happens. Um, this makes use of all the new APIs, like full screen. Um, and it's one of those um, strategy games where you're looking down on your little hobbits and helping them survive. Um, Ranger, yeah. you have proven yourself a worthy member of our group. Now oh, look, it's, it's Doug Crockford. Master our military secrets. He's giving us some I'm advice. You, commander of the operation. But I will be around this is to built on Unity. I believe this is Unity 5. All cross-compiled C++. Um, there's some C-sharp cross-compilation going on, too. Pretty amazing. Um, Bring the defenses forward. And uh, WebGL, beautiful rendering. Not that exciting a game, especially when I don't know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> I think you set towers up. Let's see. Yes, thank you. Thank you, hand. OK, I'm going to put some towers here, and they're going to defend my, my land from invading. Um. Here comes the first wave. I can use magic, too, in a minute. Don't forget to build towers. Remember, as you build additional towers at one time, the cost yes. goes up, and we don't have unlimited materials. Yeah, thanks, thanks there, Crockford, for telling me. Um, we don't have unlimited materials. Okay, uh, the good parts. Okay. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Let's take a break from this. I'll do another game that's a lot of fun. This is also based on Unity. Um, this is called Dead Trigger 2 from Mad Finger. It's a zombie game. It might get a little gory. I'll try to keep it not too bad. Um, <laughs> the best thing about this game is the sentry chickens. So you have chickens with machine guns, and they'll, they'll take care of those, those zombies for you. Let's make another one. I get very attached to my, my sentry chickens, but their machine guns overheat and explode, so it's very sad. But they, but they respawn. Let's see if there's any, any golden pig for me to get here. No. They're doing great. It's really kind of PG-13 rated here because I don't have to kill anything with my axe. That's good. Um, Again, 60 frames a second. Uh-oh, there's a big tanker guy coming. There he is. No, where is he? Somewhere around here. There he is. He's kind of stuck on a treadmill. Uh-oh, here he comes. Grenade time. All right, that's enough of that. You have to ask, why are the zombies carrying so much cash around? <laughs> I don't know. All right. So maybe this is uh, old news to some of you, but it's, it's amazing to see programs written for you know, Xbox or PS4 or whatever cross-compiled to the web running in JavaScript. I did JavaScript in such a hurry, I had never dreamed it would become this assembly language for the web. But you know, these things happen in evolutionary systems. You can't really stop them. Uh, they sort of have their own logic, and you have to help them if you want to maximize the value that everyone has built up on the web, which I think is worth doing still. So that's why I say always bet on JS. Thanks.